Alright guys, so last time we learned about the celestial sphere. We learned about what azimuth is and altitude. Uh, for example, azimuth is direction, whether you're to the right or the left of the zenith if you are on the celestial meridian. Remember this is your celestial meridian. If it's between the zenith and this point, it's in north. If it's between the zenith and this point, it's in south. If it's on the horizon, it's going to some be somewhere between west and east. So on this side, you will have northeast, east, south. On the opposite side, you will have west, southwest, and northwest. And how we label these based on degrees. Um, we learned about how you use azimuth and altitude in order to talk about where a star is, where we're going to see it. And we learned about how we use declination and where we are compared to the celestial equator in order to determine what time it should show up or what its maximum altitude is. And remember, maximum altitude is when it falls on the celestial meridian. Okay, I'll give you a quick look at this. So don't forget, maximum altitude falls on the celestial meridian. Otherwise, it has not yet risen. When we look for stars in the sky, we always want to look for where it is on the celestial meridian. Now, we're going to talk more about uh, celestial motion. We will cover the precession of the Earth, some info on the sizes of the moon and the sun, movement of heavenly bodies to a point, and end with some more details on the celestial sphere, which we will revisit in lab four. So Earth's precession, the first thing I want you to do here is hit play on the little video clip that's here for you. I'm sure you all vaguely remember the word precession from our first couple of lectures. I'm going to define it for you explicitly. The precession of a planet is the wobble that happens as it spins. Uh, so remember, planets aren't straight up and down. They all have an axial tilt. And that axial tilt as it spins causes it to go back and forth. That is the wobble. That is the precession of a planet. Planets do something very similar to what we see in this video, or a spinning top. The wobble is actually dependent on its core, how molten it is. Okay? Uh, so a planet will wobble more the more molten its core is. So a planet with a solid core like our or a planetary body with a solid core, let's say our moon, will not actually wobble as it spins. But Earth will. Mars does. Venus does. And even Mercury does. Even Jupiter. And this can be seen as the poles shift. Okay, so if the axial tilt is this way, as it spins, the pole will shift. Okay? Earth's precession, for example, is 26,000 years. That is a long time. The effects that we see take a long time to shift. You actually won't notice it as we are right now. If you were to live 26,000 years, you would notice it. This wobble actually affects the stars we see as the pole shifts back and forth and back and forth. Uh, so let's see things that have, have changed. 4,000 years ago, our North Star was the star Thuban. In 7,000 years in our future, there will be a South Star, but no North Star. In 12,000 years, our North Star will be Vega. So that shift is pretty important. Well, what does this change? It can't be that important, right? Well, it doesn't change our orbit. The ecliptic and the zodiac remain the same. But the equinoxes and the solstices will occur on different zodiacs. Basically, instead of having the um, let's say Sagittarius being in December, it will actually shift. Sagittarius will be somewhere else in a different season. Seven thousand, uh, about 1,000 years ago, the first day of summer actually occurred when the sun was in Cancer, which is why we have the name the Tropic of Cancer. Today, however, the first day of summer occurs when the sun is in the Gemini constellation, and that's why people born between June 1st and June 21st are considered Geminis. It used to be Cancer. Astronomers base the zero point of bright ascension for the sun on its position during the vernal equinox. So the celestial coordinates change some every year 
because we are slowly changing in our direction. This causes slow changes in Earth's climate. Currently, we are closest to the sun in winter, but in about 13,000 years, we will be the farthest point from the sun, and summer will be the closest point, which will make the seasons in the northern hemisphere more severe. Currently, seasons are more severe in the southern hemisphere, but once that precession hat starts to get to a certain point, it shifts. Then we will be closest to the sun in summer and farthest from the sun in winter. So our winters will be colder, have, we'll have more snow or more severe weather. And in the summer, we will have warmer, hotter summers, more severe weather again. So again, this is one of the many components, natural components of long-term climate change. And it is believed that the precession may have caused past ice ages and may have been part of the whole system. That is not to say that climate change from what scientists are saying is causing it today to go faster or slower or to cause issues isn't happening. This is just part of the natural cycle of ice ages and no ice ages, okay? Of natural climate change, not forced or changed climate change due to impact, okay? I wanna make that clear. I'm not trying to say climate change isn't a thing. What about the distance and size for the moon? So Aristarchus, another astronomer or ancient scientist, estimated that the, the size of the moon by comparing the size of Earth's shadow on the moon during a lunar eclipse to the size of the moon's disk. He determined that the moon's diameter was actually 0.33 that of Earth's diameter, or about one third. And he was actually quite close. The moon is actually 0.27 that of Earth. He also determined the distance of the moon by realizing it took three hours for the moon to complete its passage through the Earth's shadow during a lunar eclipse and that it took the moon 660 days to complete a cycle through the zodiac. He assumed Earth's shadow was about the size of the Earth, so the circumference of the moon's orbit is 660 over 3, or 220 times larger than Earth's diameter, with a distance 70 times Earth's radius. Again, not far off. The Earth-Moon distance is actually 60 times Earth's radius. So it's pretty cool what people from the ancient world were able to figure out compared to now, where we have all this technology to figure out. They pretty much had either a sextant or they would take a stick and measure the shadow and measure that. It, it was pretty fascinating. He was additionally able to calculate the distance of the sun at 20 times farther than the moon was from the Earth. And he calculated this by measuring the angle between the sun and the moon when the moon was at the first and third quarter stages. From the apparent size in the sky of the sun and the moon and relative distance along with his predetermined diameter of the moon, he deduced that the sun's diameter would be seven times that of Earth. So this was a bit off. It's actually about 100 times larger than Earth and much, much more distant. But Aristarchus's work shows us an early recognition that the sun is actually larger than the Earth and then it may have influenced the view of Helios of a heliocentric solar system, which is pretty neat. Eratosthenes made the first measurement of the size of the Earth while living in Egypt. He was the head librarian of what was then known as the Library of Alexandria, you know, before it got burned to the ground. He heard that the more southern Egyptian city of Cyan, now Aswan, the sun was directly overhead on the summer solstice at noon with no shadows. And this is very important. That means that they were on the equator. The sun being directly overhead with no shadows at noon on the summer solstice. When the sun's supposed to be directly overhead, that means you're on the equator. When you're on the equator on the summer solstice, there is no shadow. It's the worst day to be a shadow person. So what did he do? Well, he goes, okay. So I know that the distance between Alexandria and what is now known as S1 is X, right? He was able to say, the distance between Cyan or S1 and Alexandria equals X. And he goes, all right, so I know the distance. And I can use geometry to then take this X and figure out the circumference of the Earth. If you want to talk about fantastical, how did he do this? This is very important. The sun's rays are parallel to the Earth. This is why being at the equator is so important on the summer solstice where there's no shadow because the sun's rays are literally going to continue being parallel towards you. If you are above or below, you actually get an angle that the sun's rays will essentially collide with you. And this angle is due to a curve on the Earth's surface. 
Geometry dictates that corresponding angles formed where a single line crosses two parallel lines are equal and therefore an angle is formed. This is how he was able to do this. Sun's rays come to Earth. We can figure out the angle, which was seven degrees. Um, and so he was able to use the latitude between the two cities and the angle created between them, which was seven degrees. Um, and he actually measured this with sticks and a protractor. Uh, the angle between the direction of the sun and the stick pointing vertically upward as an angle, and he found it to be 1 50th of a circle, or 7 degrees. So if the angle between the two cities is 1 50th of a circle, and the Earth is a sphere, then it must be 1 50th of Earth's circumference. The distance in that time's measurements between the two cities was 500 stadia. One stadium is assumed to be about 0.16 kilometers. So 5,000 stadia times 50 equals 250,000 stadia, or about 40,000 kilometers, which is actually approximately the size of the Earth. And that's pretty fascinating. So again, angle is about 7 degrees, which is 1 50th of a circle. Earth is a sphere. Yes, at this time they knew Earth was a sphere. So it was very well known that Earth was a sphere. So that, that one cartoon movie about Columbus where they thought they would fall off the edge of the Earth isn't true. They just didn't realize there was land over there. No one had ever gone there. All right, so you have 1 50th of the circumference. Distance between the two cities is 500 stadia. One stadium is 0.16 kilometers. So if we do 5,000 times 50, we get 250,000. Divide that by 0.16, we have 40,000 kilometers. And again, that is approximately the circumference of the Earth. That is pretty astounding that they were able to determine this when the Library of Alexandria was still around. So basically ancient Greece. Let's bring this forward. How do we actually determine the sizes of astronomical bodies? Well, there's two ways. One, measure how big it looks, or its angular size. And two, determine linear size. So with angular size, you're going to essentially use your eyeballs, and you're going to look at something, and you're going to draw an imaginary line to those things, and then measure that angle with a protractor. Uh, this angle is known as alpha. And alpha it's very dependent on how close you are because it's from your point of view. So angular distance, very dependent on how close you are to an object physically. The closer you are, the larger the angle. The farther you are, the smaller the angle. So that means angular size depends inversely on its distance. Now we have linear size. Linear size is determined by an object's angular size. The L is an object's diameter. So it, it, it is known as the angular size formula or small angle formula because it works best for smaller angles, basically things that are more distant. So we do the diameter over the circumference equals alpha over 360 times 2 pi times the diameter times alpha over 360. If we take 2 pi over 360, we get 57.3, which is important for relating alpha to L. So overall, this is the formula we use. But it is much easier instead of doing alpha over three, uh, 2 pi over 360 is doing 57.3 times d equals l. So let's try it ourselves. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to try to solve this problem. Your alpha is 0.5 degrees, and the distance from the Earth to the moon is 384,000 kilometers. And I want you to find l. So I want you to pause it and take a couple minutes and try to do it first. And then come back and we'll go through it. We're going to go ahead and go on with it. L, 3,400 kilometers. That's your answer. How do we get it? L equals 384 kilometers, or distance, times 0.5 over 57.3. Because remember, 2 pi over 360 equals 57.3. So instead of going 2 pi times alpha over 360, we do divide those two, and you just take alpha over the remainder, which is 57.3. So doing that together, you get 3,400 kilometers. So let's go back to the celestial sphere. We're going to revisit maximum altitude in a bit more detail, and we're going to do some hands-on stuff. Maximum altitude is found by adding a star's altitude to a certain number, which we're going to call x. If it's greater than 90, remember, we subtract it by 180. If it's not greater than 90, or it's less than 90, or equal to, it's just 
x plus the declination equals whatever number you get. This is the full curve of the celestial sphere that we're looking at. All right, so if we were to revisit our celestial sphere, remember this bottom part that goes around in a circle is the horizon, and this bubble or half sphere is the celestial meridian. Basically, from south to north is 180 degrees, half a circle, 180 degrees, with 90 degrees on each side. So from, south, from north to the zenith, 90 degrees. From south to the zenith, 90 degrees. If you were to take x, and let's say x was 50 degrees, so if we were located up north at, uh, in New Jersey, where I live, we are 50 degrees from the celestial equator. So we do 50 degrees plus D. And let's say that equals 125, 125 degrees. So this is zero to 90 to 180. So 125 is probably right around here. Well, that means we've gone too far, which means we're supposed to be on this side of the celestial sphere. We are going to take that number and subtract it by 180 because we are over 90 degrees. So that means we get 55, which means we're probably more around here, 55 degrees north. But let's say we did that and we got a number that was, let's say, 25 degrees. We're less than 90, so we don't need to trouble it. But how do we find x? Originally in your lab, which was my original version, your x was 50 degrees. This was because I had made our location 40 degrees from the North Celestial Pole, which essentially is in Union, New Jersey. And the reason that is, is because that's where I did this lab at my university in Kane. So the original lab that I had was in Union, New Jersey. So our X was 50 degrees from the North Celestial Pole. Where we are right now is about 27, 30 degrees. So Tampa is 30 degrees latitude from the North Celestial Pole. And I believe Ruskin is 27. So X is your celestial equator, depending on your location relative to the North Celestial Pole in the Northern Hemisphere will determine your celestial equator. Because Tampa is 30 degrees latitude, we add 10 to it and we get 40 degrees, as that would be your horizon, basically 10 degrees plus your location. So if you are located at additional spots, so you're located 30 degrees from the North Celestial Pole, what is your celestial equator? We're going to add 10, so we are 40 degrees. And if we see a star with a declination of 33, what would its max altitude be? If you are located 20 degrees from the North Celestial Pole, what is your celestial equator? If you see a star with a declination of 50, what is its max altitude? If you are located at 45 degrees from the North Celestial Pole, what is your celestial equator? If you see a star with a declination of 65, what is its maximum altitude? So I'll do the first one with you. So 30 plus 10 equals 40 degrees. That is our x, all right? So then what do we have to do? We have to do x plus the declination of the star, and that will equal our max altitude. So we have x, x is 40 degrees. Our declination is 33. That means our max altitude is 73 degrees. This is what I need you to do. This is your question for today. You will do all of these, post them up, and then I will follow up with you on the answer. So please make sure that you answer both of these questions. Anyway, that is our lecture for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to go back through, um, re-listen to anything. Please make sure you watch that video of the procession going back and forth. It is pretty cool. Um, if you spin a top, as it starts to slow down, it will do that also. That is the procession of a top. Um, and again, please make sure to do this online. I do want to see if you guys are able to figure this out because this is going to be on your next lab. Um, and I hope you guys have a great night. See you later.